as we already spoke, there are types of delirium. There is hyperactive delirium. There could be hypoactive delirium or there could be a spectrum which lies in between the two, which is caused as mixed delirium. It is always the mixed delirium which is more detrimental for the patient, which in studies has been shown to be correlating with more mortality when it is present in your patient. One day your patient is hyperactive, the other day he becomes hypoactive. Then that is a heartbringer of uh, more problems as far as delirium is concerned. So hyperactive means agitation, hypervigilance, uh, hallucinations. Hypoactive means stupor, psychomotor retardation and lethargy. And in mix, they shift between these two conditions. Coming on to the management, which is the topic for uh, today's discussion. So most important uh, intervention in terms of a problem, a medical problem is always prevention is better than cure. So you should be the ones who should be proactive in making your patients comfortable in the ICU environment. Now, this also means that you are uh, speaking to your patients every day and speaking in clear language to them, which is discernible by them. If they are using any hearing aids and you uh, have been conversing with them, then there is no point of your uh, uh, hard work which you are putting in rather than going on to their attendants and asking them if they have been using any hearing aids or any other aids in terms of spectacles, which could be more and more important when they are in, in the ICU. So always make it a point you ask their attendants once you are... Uh, talking to them initially uh, during the assessment of the patient if they had any hearing aids or any kind of other aid which they were using during their normal life. So non-pharmacological approaches have been proven to be more important in terms of prevention as well as, well as the treatment of delirium. The, the removal of risk factors, which we just spoke about, I had put in a lot of slides uh, regarding the risk factors deliberately so that something goes uh, with you today from these slides. So we can't remember all of the slides, but something which we have a visual impression of, we always remember in life. That is why I had put in different kind of slides to make it imperative that you at least take few risk factors which you will remember during your ICU rounds and ask your patients uh, about these risk factors. So all of these risk factors need to be removed. If you think your uh, patient is not getting adequate sleep during uh, the ICU stay, you should be catering to their uh, hindrances, which is making them uh, 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 hinder their sleep during the night. So uh, for example, if we could think of uh, the, 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 the sponging, which usually happens during the morning time, if your patient has been sleeping less, you could change the, the timing of uh, uh, the, the sponging which happens early morning. So often we have seen if they are woken up early during the, uh, during the morning for cleaning and sponging, they do not get their adequate sleep. So these are small, small interventions which you can look at uh, and along with a round table uh, meeting with your staff in the ICU, your nurses who are the pillar of your ICU care and sitting with your doctors who are all uh, there as a team and uh, taking out certain uh, inferences out of each and every one of your patients and uh, further implementing them in your ICU. So blood pressure control is also of utmost, utmost importance because if your patient is either hyper or hypotensive, it can lead to problems of perfusion, thus causing problems in their uh, uh, brain states, can lead to confusional states and delirium. Optimal water balance is very, very important. In addition to medical problems, in addition to getting your patients out of the ventilator early, these are the factors which could be responsible for your patients having more amount of delirium. So dehydration, if your patient is having a dehydration, they will be more confused, they will have more electrolyte disturbances, and they will have more problem of delirium. Appropriate management of acidemia is also really, really important. Um, acidemia, as all of us know, will lead to vasoconstriction in our pulmonary circulation, which can cause hypoxia, which can further lead on to problems in the brain in terms of uh, supplying the, the amount of oxygen which the brain needs, which can lead to delirium. 
Avoid prolonged mechanical ventilation. If you think that your patient has gone out of the situation which they came with, if your underlying condition has been treated partially or fully, if they have become more or less uh, uh, better in terms of their hemodynamic instability, if they are able to get uh, more uh, vigilant, they are able to get out of the drowsiness which, which they came with in type 2 respiratory failure, for, for example, their COPD, and now that is getting better, you should be the one who should be preferring early weaning and extubation in them. Because prolonged mechanical ventilation has um, many, many detrimental effects, including the, uh, the onset of delirium and the presence of cognitive effects in these patients after their ICU stay is over. Also, we should be looking at the ABCDE bundle, uh, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Early mobilization, very, very important. If we stop the sedation every day and give spontaneous breathing trials, these have been seen in the studies to be beneficial for our studies. They can wean your patients off early in the course of their mechanical ventilation, as well as prevent the onset of delirium in your patients. Of course, sepsis control is also important because once you're able to control the source of infection in these acutely ill, Ill patients who, who come to us in the medical ICUs, you are able to control uh, and prevent further uh, damage to other organs and uh, uh, arrest the, the multi-organ failure which can set in these patients leading on to uh, less amount of delirium in these patients. So also we can prevent and treat uh, delirium with the pharmacological agents. We'll come to this in, in our uh, next slides, but uh, we will realize no medicine till now has been seen to be beneficial in terms of either treatment or prevention of delirium in our ICU patients. All of these medications, though they are used in our ICU patients, but in studies, we haven't found any mortality benefit in terms of prevention or treatment of our delirious patients. So dexmetomidine, haloperidol, atypical antipsychotics, statins, ketamine, melatonin, these are all uh, the drugs which have been studied, though the studies, studies in some cases have been small studies, but uh, we have certain randomized control trials which have given us certain kind of results which we will be speaking about. So this is the A, B, C, D, E, uh, F bundle which we have been uh, saying a lot uh, in our uh, discussion. It is to assess, prevent and manage pain. Very, very important. So we could be using certain pain sco scores amongst which the visual pain score is very important in patients who are uh, conscious enough. In those patients who are not conscious, you can be looking at other parameters like heart rate, blood pressure, wincing when you press them, if they are on sedation. So inadequate pain control has been correlated with the worse outcomes. So re use of regional anesthesia and non-opioid adjuncts, analgesia-based sedation wherein the patient is controlling the analgesia with fentanyl could be used, which can be important in terms of pain management. Daily spontaneous breathing trial and uh, 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 assessment trial, multidisciplinary coordination of care, talking to your physiotherapist, talking to your uh, sisters about uh, the amount of secretions which these patients have, whether they have been hemodynamically stable, whether they have been moving about during the night, they have been conversing with the, with the staff around. These are the factors which could be helpful in liberating them from their mechanical ventilation faster. Regarding C, the choice of sedation, targeted light sedation with sedation uh, given when only necessary is one of the steps which you could be looking at. And avoidance of benzodiazepines is the one which I want to focus upon because benzodiazepines are the medications which have been seen in studies to be responsible for delirium in a lot of people and they have worse outcomes as far as delirium is concerned. Initially, dexmetomidine is the one which had given us uh, very good uh, vibes and it had, uh, it had been a promising drug 
in terms of delirium. Uh, it, uh, it was thought to be having a low risk of delirium, especially in cardiac surgery and in case of our weaning patients. However, as we did more and more of uh, randomized controlled trials um, and further trials, it was seen that there was no mortality benefit and there was no benefit in terms of decreasing the delirium load in the ICU patients. So D is delirium monitoring and management, routine use of CAM ICU and ICDSC assessments, which we spoke about, non-pharmacological interventions, very, very important, including sleep hygiene, which has to be taken care of is very important. Dexmed or antipsychotic treatment, if hyperactive symptoms are, are there, can help your patients. E is for early mobilization and exercise. Physical and occupational therapy is of utmost, utmost importance when your ICU care patient uh, is concerned because to prevent the, the, the myoneuropathy also, it is important that you are doing the physiotherapy. Coordinate the activity with spontaneous awakening trial or periods of no sedation in the morning. You give them the therapy uh, at that, that point of time. Progress through range of motion, sitting, standing, waking, activities of daily life and daily mobilization. Family engagement and empowers is the F1, which is reorientation, provision of emotional and verbal support, telling them every day, even if they are sedated, that yes, you are getting better. You came with, with this condition. Now you are far better. You are going to get out of this uh, condition is something which you can reiterate to your patients. And I have had the pleasure of talking to certain people who were ventilated earlier and when they were, uh, when they were extubated and uh, we, we spoke to them about uh, the most irritated uh, uh, problem or most irritating condition or conversation between the ICU staff. They all told us that uh, even if we were sedated, we could hear the every conversation which was going on during the change of shifts. So be careful what you speak in front of your patients during the change of shifts, especially when we, when we uh, talk to our other colleagues, we sometimes have a tendency to tell this, that this particular patient might not be able to come out of the ventilator or they may not be getting better but please speak it out of the cabin or chamber of your patients because they are the ones who listen to these conversations and it can have a very bad impact upon their recovery. So please don't speak any kind of negative language in front of your patients. Uh, hence, it is very, very important every day you're telling your patients that you'll be getting better. You came in with this condition, but uh, things are looking better and you are getting better. So cognitive stimulation, participation in mobilization and participation in multidisciplinary team rounds are the ones which should be advocated in every ICU, which can lead to better outcomes. If we think about dexto, uh, dexmetomidine, it had shown a promising uh, uh, role when, uh, as far as uh, the delirium is concerned because uh, initially, it was given as a, a pain control agent, not leading on to uh, a lot of sedation in the patients. It could be used post-operatively as well as in, in patients who are weaning. But RCTs on mechanically ventilated patients with sepsis, a post-hoc analysis showed Dexmed did not increase the number of days free from delirium or coma over that in the control group uh, which who were sedated with medications other than Dexmed, such as Propofol or Midazolam, or for that matter, our uh, fentanyl or opioid drugs. So um, not a promising drug again, but uh, if you think you have experience with this medication, your patient is going to get better with this, then no harm in using this particular medication. Again, Propofol, if we compare it with the benzodiazepine, the Society of Critical Care uh, Medicine in 2018 guidelines has given a conditional recommendation to favor Propofol in place of benzodiazepines as far as the choice of sedation uh, agent is concerned. So this has been uh, seen to be having uh, a beneficial effect in terms of prevention of delirium if used in place of benzodiazepines, though they are smaller studies, but still significant, but sometimes cost can be uh, an issue which can come uh, in between you using this kind of medication. 
these are the major trials for uh, prevention uh, and treatment of delirium which have been done in in certain patients you will see uh, in 2007 it was a men's trial about 106 ventilated patients dexmed was compared against lorazepam for sedation and there was significant increase in delirium and coma free days in the dexmed group uh, based upon which uh, its use came in into the ico patients but as you see lower down the list when we went further with the trials it was seen that it didn't make any significant dis, uh, difference. Again, Dexmed with midazolam, significant reduction in delirium and increase in delirium free days. Then we compared haloperidol versus placebo. There was no significant difference in the incidence or duration of delirium. This was the HOPE ICU trial in 2013. That is why I have been telling you, even if uh, though we use this medication in the ICU for control of delirium, but it hasn't shown a significant difference in the incidence or uh, duration of delirium in our patients. Rosuvastatin versus placebo, again, no significant difference. Simvastatin, which is a statin with placebo, no significant difference. Again, Dexmed plus fentanyl versus usual care, no significant difference. Ketamine versus placebo, significant reduction in delirium and increase in delirium free days in the ket uh, ketamine group. However, the number of patients is small here. Hence, they say that we need more uh, randomized controlled trials. Remeltian, which is a, a, a congener of melatonin versus a placebo in smaller number of patients, lower prevalence and shorter duration of delirium in the Remeltian group. But as we see, the number of patients is small. We need more trials. Low-dose nocturnal dexmed versus placebo, significant reduction in delirium, but 100 patients only. On the other hand, if we see this Spice 3 trial in 2019, about 4,000 patients, wherein Dexmed versus usual care uh, was, was given, we saw on the paradoxical and significant increase in delirium and coma-free days in Dexmed group, uh, uh, but no difference in the mortality. So that is why I have been saying, even though we had a promising result from Dexmed, later on we saw that we didn't have a good result with Dexmed as well. So again, if you see uh, this melatonin versus placebo, though we have seen a significant improvement in sleep quality without a significant difference in the incidence of delirium and the number is low, uh, we cannot recommend melatonin for the treatment or prevention of delirium in our ICU.